So I'll start off with this. Um, the, the first uh, line of attack is something that I expected, which is normal for Muslims to raise, especially Muslim traditionalists, which is, hey, you're using the Western historical critical method. And did our Muslim scholars really get this wrong for some 1,400 years? Well, let me tell you something. Actually, the vast majority of Muslims, including Muslim traditionalists, love the historical critical method. In fact, we've made Bart Ehrman, Sheikh Bart Ehrman. Uh, when it comes to any other religion other than our own, we love the historical critical method. In fact, uh, Dr. Al Masri's own student, Jake, when he is a convert to Islam, when he debates uh, Christians, and if a Christian were to show him 1 John 5, 7 and John 14, 6 as proof of the Trinity, I am the way, I am the truth, that verse with, the, with Jesus, what will Jake most likely say or have said? He'll say, hey, you know that biblical scholarship has shown that this doesn't actually go back to Jesus, that Jesus didn't actually say that. In fact, we love historical critical scholarship. That's why in Blogging Theology, on that show, they have one biblical scholar after another. But when it comes to the Islamic tradition, all of a sudden, it's hands off. This is actually a case of special pleading. Um, even you can look at what historical scholarship has said. So I'll give you um, a summary. Uh, this is uh, by a scholar who summarizes the consensus about biblical scholarship when it comes to the Bible. He writes, there is a consensus among biblical scholars that Jesus, to all historical probability, did not consider himself as part of the Trinity. Nowhere did Jesus teach a Trinitarian doctrine. He believed in one God and strictly refused to be equated with God. Instead, he was likely considered a divinely authorized messenger, and Jesus was, a was considered a prophet. We Muslims love that. And when we see a Christian relying upon biblical verses that historical scholarship has shown doesn't actually go back to Jesus, what do we say? We say, oh my God, how could you do that? It's so stupid. Now, do you think Christians like the fact that biblical scholars, do you think they like Bart Ehrman, a lot of them? No, they don't like it. They don't like when it's being said. But this is normal for all religions. So we can't do what's called special pleading. The other thing I would say, and that goes to the idea of for 1,400 years. Well, for 2,000 years, the Christian church has held Trinitarian doctrines and other doctrines like that. How does that mean anything? The other thing is that there's a myth of consensus. So there is no, con first of all, we know there's a famous saying, whoever claims a consensus has lied, is a liar. There's no such thing as this consensus. There are scholars and thinkers in our Islamic history who have had pluralistic views. In fact, in the article, which was linked to the article that Dr. Al-Masri posted by Jonathan Brown, there was one to Yasser Qadi's article in which Dr. Qadi, I looked at his, in the book version, on one page he claimed that there's a consensus on this issue. On the very next page he said, oh yeah, there were some pluralists who were the Islamic philosophers and the Sufi thinkers. So wait a second, there is no consensus, unless you exclude anyone who disagrees with you and then claim that there's a consensus. Well, that's, uh, that's a certain methodology you could use, but it's not very convincing. So this idea that you could just defend your view based on what people have said for 1400 years, we wouldn't be debating Christians then, right? So the other thing is Dr. Al-Masri said that um, I, I didn't really understand this issue of hermeneutics. Um, the hermeneutics, and, and, and he also said this issue about tafsir. I didn't use tafsir, there was no reception history here. What I used was historical critical scholarship, which looks at the Quran directly. I didn't cite Fred Donner because Donner said what he said, as if he's a sheikh. I, sa I cited Donner because his argument is convincing. There are stuff that I don't agree with other scholars about that I don't quote. Sometimes I quote what I like, what is consistent with what looks to be true, right? So that's how historical scholarship works. So we can't just claim that because you know scholars have said this from my sect for 1,400 years, and it's not 1,400 years ever, by the way, but in any case. Um, all right, then I did not quote, I just made, I'm going down my list. So I did not quote hadith, so that was not me violating any rules there. What I was showing with the hadith was not to make it look, people make this look bad, rather I was showing the divergence in theology, how it diverges from the Quranic theology. And that's an important point to, that historians look at to look at when theology changes and why. In fact, the ver we actually see, it's not a suspicious like uh, conspiracy theory or anything, these are anxieties that happen with every religious tradition. Every religious tradition, there's quotes from scholars that you can see that say that every religious tradition will, um, I'm just gonna quote one thing here. Um, give me one second here. So as one historian says, and this is Fred Donner as well, um, 
that the Muslim community would have taken great pains to project back into the story of its origins those features that had come to be decisive in the later tradition. Similarly, another historian, Stephen Shoemaker, says, the history of religions, this is not related to Islam specifically, it's all religions, teaches us that as a general rule, a religious community's memory of its period of origins is usually highly suspect from a historical point of view. Do you think any of us in this room are going to take what Buddhists say in their uh, religious settings as being historical about what Buddha did? I mean, with no other religion do we do this. It's only with ours because we think that we have a monopoly and, and we can be special pleading. And in other settings in the Islamic world, you wouldn't even be allowed to have these talks and discussions. Um, as Robert Hoyland says, of course later Muslim historians would play down this pluralist dimension. It's not a conspiracy theory. It's a normal process of historical development whereby religious boundaries are formed. This is a normal process. So there's no conspiracy theory at all. Now, I didn't use any allegory. As a historian, you want to use the, what the text is actually saying in its original context, which is actually on one level very literal. All right. Um, let's see. Now I wanted to get in. You know, it was very uh, light on uh, Quranic verses. Uh, the only Quranic verses, so the most you could say, remember, keep in mind the thesis that I raised. The thesis I raised was that there are submitters in the early Muslim uh, following the Prophet Muhammad who did consider him their leader, and they probably also considered him a prophet, but not they did not need to follow the Quranic law. And that is extremely clear in the Quran itself. So this does not discount the thesis. So as all of these historians are saying, it's not just me, it's that the early community included people, believe, uh, so the people of the book, they had to make a decision. Are they going to side with the believers when they were being persecuted by the Arabian pagans? They fled Mecca, went to Medina. At this point in time, there was a binary choice. Do you support the persecutors or the persecuted? Are you going to be a part of the community of believers? So yes, those people who sided with the Kafirs, the people who sided with the pagans, themselves became infidels. But it's those people who sided socially and politically that is being talked about here. Now, um, if we look at the verse that I, the reason why I asked for the verse to be shown is if you look at 2.137, you'll see, and this is where I say the exclusive aside actually is the one who plays fast and loose with the Quranic evidence and actually does scriptural hermeneutics and doesn't actually look at things in their context. If we look at verse 2.137, he and Dr. Qadi also in his article that was linked also said the same mistranslation. Actually, the Quran says, and if they believe in the like of what you have believed, it doesn't say exactly as you have believed. So this is a, a key distinction that needs to be made. Now, in multiple verses, there are some verses that do indicate, again, that they had to affirm the prophet in some capacity. Now, what capacity that was, it, like, this is what historians say, it ranged from either, so he came to Medina as an arbiter. He was arbitrating between the two different, uh, between the different factions, and they had to go to him when they had disputes. And that's why the Quran actually says that why are they coming to you for judgment when they have the Torah with them and judge by the Torah? But if they do come to you, then give them the judgment. It's not contrasting the Torah with the Quran. It's contrasting the Torah and the Quran on one side with their whims and desires on the other. So when they're saying that we don't make any distinction between the prophets, we don't make any distinctions between the scriptures, it's because these are considered to be parallel scriptures. So it's, and, and Dr. Al-Masri has to deal with many of the verses that he himself showed, which actually showed that believers, what we consider Muslims today, have to believe in the Torah and the gospel as well. So he's using those verses as proof that they have to believe in the Quran, but then that also means that you have to believe in the Torah and the gospel, which is with them. With them. It's not the Torah and the gospel in the past, okay? So these are problems that need to be addressed. Also, many of the verses that he used are out of context and are actually talking about, so for example, um, look at 4.136 that he cited. You'll look, this is actually one of the passage, one of the Quranic surahs with, mo with the most pluralistic uh, passages. So it actually says, first of all, 4.136 says that you need to follow. So it says, oh, you who believe, Believe in God. First of all, it's referring to the believers. All right? It's, you have to understand who is it talking to. Here it's talking to the believers, not to the people of the book. Believe in God and his messenger and the book he sent down upon his messenger, the Quran. 
and the book he sent before, which is what? The Torah and the Gospel. Now, uh, if you... Yeah, we, we are running out of time. We made a commitment yep. to each other. Absolutely. Uh, so you have another chance. Five Absolutely. Minutes. Absolutely. Okay. It was. I wish I could have gone a chance to look at all the verses, but we'll we'll, yes. we'll continue yes. it. Thank we you. Got, yeah. All right. So um, the historical critical method. Westerners are not the only people who have brains. Who understand how to separate facts from fiction? When I said we're not relying upon them, we're not relying on their conclusions not the concept and idea that they're the they're able and they have a methodology of deriving uh, separating fact from fiction in transmitted reports in fact the muslims were one of the pioneers in this subject the muslims were pioneers in the subject so the concept of them separating fact from fiction is not the issue it's the conclusions and you did rely upon some of their conclusions their conclusions of what don are saying about this verses or who are these people None of that has any validity to it. Their conclusions don't have validity. Now, if we're going to discuss that they are capable and able to separate fact from fiction, then what is more likely, as I said earlier, that they're separating fact from fiction and their objective, why is it that their objectivity is given primacy and their ability to separate fact from fiction is given primacy over the very early Muslims who, well, as you said, you said the or, the or, the original people around the prophet or around the Buddha, whatever example that you gave, why would we suspect them? Why is the default that they're suspicious? The others are going to try to promote their prophet. They're just going to try to promote what, whatever is the motive. But the undertone there is that the, if you're a religious follower of that prophet, you can't be relied upon. But if you're a non-believer, you somehow have no prejudices, and you only have the historical critical method, that's the undertone that I'm differing with. And you didn't just bring that they are bringing us history. You cited their conclusions, their interpretations, which is not acceptable. Secondly, I still don't understand how is it that this verse that you asked me to refer to, which one was it? For, uh, what is it? Oh, this, if they believe in what you believe in, mithl, okay, in the likeness of it. It's likeness and it's exactitude, right? So we're not going to get into the weeds of what a certain word means. Okay. Secondly, these scholars didn't understand properly and were exclusivistic. Who pre we cite the Quran only, right? Who preserves the Quran? Who preserved this very book that you're citing? Who preserved it? Where did we get it from? From these scholars who said this is what it means. Okay? And as we said, we're not going to tafsir. All right. So I don't really have much of a rebuttal except to stick with the verses that I cited. We can open up for a conversation. But other than that, you mentioned historical critical. I answered that. Uh, the presence of non-consensus. The presence of someone saying something does not... Consensus and interpretation is on interpretive verses. Certain things, there's no interpretation in. There's no interpretation in the transmission that George Washington was a president of the United States and part of the early revolution. All right, so I stand here and say, no, he wasn't. He didn't exist. Is that now there's no consensus on George Washington, right? So there is, there are certain historical facts that do not, they, the, the, a, 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 con, a, a, a contrary statement means nothing. I can write a whole book about it. I could just go and do gymnastics to tell you that George Washington was not part of the United States. Did you see him? Right? Is there scientific proof? So the presence of some consensus, let's look at the other things they believe and say, are they even reliable at all to have a conclusion? Let's bring out all the other things that they said. And then let's go see if that was even correct about what they said like the transmission of even what they said. So if we're going to go the route of consensus and not consensus, and you're saying that there is a presence of non-consensus, bring it out. Let's see what they said, right? If we're going to go that route. I could have went that route. I probably would have had resources up to here, right? I also want to ask if these, this root of the matter is questioned. If the root of the matter, right, is something that's questionable, is not the entire religion questionable? So how could the correct interpretation of a religion 
be that which brings its own destruction. So it's unnecessary, right? The whole thing is unnecessary, right or wrong. So I asked the question, well, well, why bring a new religion then? Why would God bring a new religion if it's unnecessary? You don't bring an update to something unless it is nasik to the previous scripts. And I can read to you. You light on verses. All right, you said it. I'm light on verses. I'm not light on verses. I was being kind, right? And <laughs> not, I appreciate and that. not bringing so many verses to just just drown everyone in it. But let's bring some verses on this religion that you say is acceptable to be followed according to the Quran. Why is the Quran in constant attack on its reliability? Why is it in constant attack, stating that the Torah and the Injil have been altered, that they're not reliable? And it says, "Oh, Jews and Christians, do not say." Except what is the truth? Okay. Verses showing that why do you reject the revelation? Why do you alter the revelation? Many ayat that I could go through for here, just give me a second. Previously revealed books have been corrupted. They twist words out of context. How are we going to follow it then? The same thing. They twist words out of context and disregard much of what they were reminded of. Listeners to lies and transmitters of lies. They distort words from their place. Secondly, let's go to logic for a second. If God is accepting of the Jewish faith and the Christian faith and the Islamic faith, if I worship sincerely according to these, then I'm also a believer that God is accepting two opposite things. So is Jesus son of God or is he a bastard boy? Is Mary, is Mary a righteous woman who had a miraculous birth? Or did she commit adultery? These aren't fuzzy lines. This is far apart. Which one is it? So if all these are acceptable paths to God, you said they're lanes. I don't say they're lanes. One is going north. One is going east. One is going south. And you're telling us they're going to the same destination. They're opposites. Logic tells us one's got to be right. One's got to be wrong. These two opposites cannot be true. Is Muhammad a liar? They say he's a liar. Some say he's crazy, he's deluded, and some say he's a truthful prophet of God. Uh, guess what? They're all going to have all these opposite sayings about God's, God's uh, prophets. Is Jesus a prophet? Is son of God a, a, a Jewish rebel? Which one is it? So by logic alone, these three opposite things cannot be true. These three opposite faiths cannot be true. And the meaning of believing Jews and Christians means completing your faith. Submitters, as I said earlier, I concede to it. Would not submitting include the prophet, peace be upon him? Okay. All right. Again, I want to be sure because this is a lively and spirited debate that each of you has the opportunity to say in response to what you have heard. We have lots of questions. But let me give you another five minutes, uh, Dr. Hashmi, to respond to what you just heard. And then if you want, have another five minutes and then we open it up to Q&A. Okay. So thank you again, Dr. al Masri. So first I will say that as far as the historical critical method is concerned in historical critical scholarship, this includes Muslim academics as well. So it's not just a non-Muslim uh, endeavor. So we have the opportunity to engage in this enterprise, and we should. And uh, so, so that's point number one. Now, as far as um, this idea that uh, we should give primacy to the uh, early exegetes, well, first of all, there is a, uh, most scholars agree that there was a, a, a gap between when the, uh, the Quran was revealed and when it was exegeted. The way we know that is in the very verses that we've cited. In verse 262 of the Quran, it uses the word Sabians. Do you know how confused the exegetes were about who the Sabians are? You get like uh, many, many different answers. And this is enough for scholars to realize that there was a gap in this. They didn't know and they were speculating. Now, were they stupid? No, they're very intelligent people. No one is saying they're stupid. No one's saying that they were colluding. But they had normal uh, interests and subjectivities. And we even see that on display today. For example, Dr. Al-Masri is saying that this is a big problem, that the root of my religion is going to be wiped off the face of the earth if I'm proven wrong. That shows that there is a huge interest, a huge uh, stake 
which motivate which creates motivated reasoning. So what's happening is just motivated reasoning, which all human beings engage in. And you can look at any other religious tradition and see this. And again, there are Muslim academics who are taking a critical look as well. All right. Um, now, as, and this is again like who preserved the Quran. It's not the same group of people who preserved the Quran. This is a complex topic, but this is just a talking point. There's a video, the three-hour talk uh, interview that I have with Dr. Joshua Little on this. Now, uh, I would like us to turn to 262 of the Quran to show that it's actually the opposite side that engaged in uh, throwing out scripture. So I want to know from Dr. Al-Masri, how does he respond to verse 262, which explicitly says that it's believers, Jews, Christians, Sabians, anyone who believes in God in the last day who will be saved. So I would love to see how he interprets this verse, and then you will see the real scriptural acrobatics. And, 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 and why isn't it the case that that verse isn't as crystal clear as the hadith that is quoted in Dr. Qadi's article, which was cited uh, by the Dr. Brown article that Dr. Al-Masri cited, which says that in the voice of the prophet that whoever hears about me and does not, and it actually says whoever, what's interesting is that this hadith actually shows the, the motivated concern because it actually says whoever from my ummah, and it uses the word ummah, which shows that actually there was a concern that there were Jews and Christians in the early ummah. So that's how historians analyze texts in a critical way and show that this text was specifically designed to rebut this fact. And that's why the hadith is crystal clear that whoever hears about me, Muhammad, and does not believe in me and is a Jew and a Christian will not be saved. That's why it's so clear in the hadith and in the Quran 262, 262 is um, the way, it, you know, it's crystal clear in the opposite direction. So um, now there are a bunch of other things that were mentioned. As far as corruption of scriptures, this is crystal clear if you look at all the verses that talk about corruption of the Torah and the gospel. It's clear that it's almost certainly talking about their oral recitation, that they're hiding things about their uh, recitation. And that's why it says that it says that they're hiding and that the prophet is bringing it out and telling them not to hide it. Now, even if you take this as textual corruption, it's still not corruption to the point of abrogation because there are a multitude of verses that say follow the Torah and the gospel and say to get judgment from them. There's in Surah 5 where they're told, why are you coming to Muhammad for judgment? Go to the Torah. Not to say go to the Torah to see that the Prophet Muhammad and, and then just become convert and become Muslim, capital M Muslim. So these are a lot of things that unfortunately I don't think were really answered. Um, as again, the verses that say, oh, first of all, and this is the last point that I'll, and then we can uh, go to the next part, but a lot of these verses that say obey God and his messenger, we have to actually look at these verses and see, first of all, who is the audience? Oftentimes the verses that they cite are, oh, you who believe. It's talking about the people who follow Muhammad as their prophet. Of course they have to follow him. There's no doubt about that. Sometimes, most of the times, the verses that they quote are actually referring to the hypocrites, all right? Because they're from the believer's ranks, all right? And they're damned, by the way. They're called kafirs, all right? Number two is uh, oftentimes the obey God. There's another verse that says, obey God and his messenger and those in authority amongst you. That shows clearly that we're talking about social and political matters. And so, and a lot of those verses that they cite are about the hypocrites who are creating insecurity in the time of war between both sides. And these are why these verses are coming and condemning them and say, no, obey God and his messenger, refer the matter to your prophet and messenger. So we need to look at the context and read verses carefully without these dogmatic need to prove my orthodox view that because it's been for quote unquote 1400 years. We are at the end of the five minutes and I heard some direct questions being addressed to you, uh, if I heard right. So why don't you take another five minutes and then we enter into a Q and A okay. time with the audience. This religion is a transmitted religion. It's one that has commentators from continents all over the world for millennia. We're going to deride that. Let's not follow what would eliminate biases, what would eliminate all biases, and follow an interpretation that is about 20 years old. If we're going to go down, well, I'll, I'll see. Let's not go down the consensus. But you're deriding that consensus and 1,400 years, as this is some dumb quote for some people who are not that bright. Was it 1,400 years? Well, 
in those 1400 years, wouldn't people have eliminated biases? Misunderstandings would have gone by the wayside. What are the chances now? All of a sudden, we've come to a great understanding of this. You also stated that Muslim academics are acceptable. Were they not academic? Where do the universities come from? They come from Andalus, right? Were they not academic? So we're inside, if we're citing academics, let's ask the question. Just because they didn't sit at desks, have lattes and computers, and were atheists, then they're not academic? So if we accept Muslim academics, then they are the best of them. Okay. And I challenge anyone to go look, read their books, look at the logic that they use. As for the motivated reasoning argument, let me ask you a question. Do you think Muslim women wake up, woke up someday and say, let's wear hijab? Do you think any youth out there, let's lower our gaze. Let's wake up at four in the morning, wash our face and our feet and pray. Let's fast for 18 hours a day. Do you think this is like our hobby? We're doing this for fun. No. So it's not motivated reason because we are not. If you ask any Muslim right now, if the prophet came today and said, by the way, all oh, this is halal. You don't have to do any of this anymore. This is not motivated reasoning to protect our club. This is not an identity that we want to have. This is something that is built upon it. The argument is, if it's crystal clear that hajj is an obligation, these roots, these, uh, these fruits of the tree, branches of the tree, if that's crystal clear, how could the root not be crystal clear? All right, you brought us to 262. Okay. There's no gymnastics here. I'm using nothing other than the Quran to explain the Quran. And that is, those who believed, alladhina hadu, past tense. You have two tafsirs of this. Those who believed, and the Christians, okay, and the Sabians, who believe in God in the last day. I already told you, God in the last day is explained in the Quran as God, angels, books, and messengers. Okay, Those are the ones, and they act righteously. They have the reward with God. They have nothing to fear, and nor will they grieve. First understanding of this. Yes, the question came, oh Muhammad, before you came, all those who put in effort, will they be saved? Yes, they will be saved. Before you came, that's the first understanding. The second understanding is it is, again, a summary. There's, there are summaries, and then there are expansions in all of our speech. If you, you come home one day, hey, what happened? Oh, I'm busy, but I'm going to tell you. We got to go, but I'm going to tell you real quick. We had an amazing day, and I got the job. That's the summary. Then later on in the evening, you say all oh, the whole story. Are they contradictory? No. How could the summary be more of an explanation than the, the, the detailed explanation? And the detailed explanation, as I told you, you have, we have to read the whole book, okay? is those who follow the messenger, the unlettered prophet, whom they find mentioned in the Torah and the Gospels in their possession. Those who believe in him and respect him and support him. How many more verbs do we want? Believe, respect, support, and follow the light that came down with him, the Quran. They are the successful ones. So if we get praise, Jews and Christians, Jew and Christian believers are praiseworthy. All right. Why are they praiseworthy? As they are? Well, what's the point of saying that then? They're praiseworthy as they are? So why is this a message to them? You are praiseworthy when you complete your faith. This is a favor for you to complete your faith that follow this book that you find. And that's exactly the same explanation as all those verses that say, oh, Jews, follow your book. In it is guidance and light. What is in it? The prophecy of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In it is guidance and light. He cited the verse. I didn't even cite it. You cited it. What's the guidance and the light? It's the prophecy of the prophet. Right? You will have a prophet like unto Moses or whatever it is in their scriptures, whatever it was. Okay, That is exactly the reason why he's telling them, follow your book. Okay, Let's rule by your book. Because if you're going to accept your book, you accept the whole thing. So that's the explanation of that. No tafsir, no gymnastics. Okay? And all the verses that I stated, okay? and I didn't want to be mean, but they weren't explained. There's a lot of explaining to do.
about these explicit, detailed, repeated verses that were not handled. Okay. Yeah, at the end of this little segment, you are clearly not out of arguments, neither, neither one of you. Uh, and I have to say, most interreligious discussions, and this is, I consider one, are not as spirited. Oftentimes, oftentimes interreligious conversations and questions about theology are not as open and forthright. And I really appreciate it that you are not saying, oh, let's just find what we have in common and then let's have some interfaith cookies, uh, which is what often debates are like. So you brought out the real uh, differences between your positions and it gave and gives all of us a lot of food for thought and contemplation. And I want to get our audience uh, involved and a chance to, to respond. Uh, let, me, let me begin with a question myself to both of you. Namely, the thesis that you agreed on was, is belief in the prophet Muhammad necessary for salvation? Mm -hmm. um, my understanding, not being a Muslim, was that Muslims don't believe in the prophet, but believe in the message that the prophet brought. So I wonder whether you can address the particular phrasing of that question that you were that you were debating. And it's okay. a question for both of you. Does it matter who goes first? No, I no. Okay. So whoever feels they well, go the, first. the your statement, the, your question, believing in the message he brought precludes that he's a messenger of God. So I cannot consider the Quran from God without believing that Muhammad is a true messenger. So that's the simple answer. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> I would say that um, our views are not as radically far apart as they may seem in the sense that I am open to the idea that the Quran is saying that the Jews and the Christians need to affirm the Prophet Muhammad in some way, um, which is possibly even as a prophet. And there is uh, a lot of historical evidence for the idea that in early history, uh, there were Muslims, oh, sorry, there were Jews and Christians who remained Jews and Christians and yet considered Muhammad to be a prophet. So in that sense, it depends on what you mean by the word believe exactly as you said. Um, so where we differ is that I believe that even in the time of the prophet, as is clear, that, and, and this is why I don't think that my thesis was actually addressed or negated, because uh, I am conceding that it is quite possible, based on the reading, that the Quran does say that they need to affirm him as being, definitely him being holy, definitely him being the leader of the community, and he, even perhaps as the prophet. And there are lots of examples in the history of that belief in early Islam, as historians have shown. So, but that does not, again, preclude the idea that he said that you can still follow the Torah and the gospel, which are uh, not corrupted textually, but orally. Um, I did want to circle back, though, at some point at this verse 262, um, because I did want to discuss how I do think that there is textual acrobatics going here. And I wanted to respond to what Dr. El Masri said about um, this referring to past Jews and Christians. Um, in fact, the article, uh, again, that I, I surveyed the article by Dr. Brown and by Dr. Qadi, as well as by Dr. Sirkeel. All of these three were linked by Dr. El Masri. And they actually, I linked them. Uh, in, your tw in your tweet, you le le tweeted, you said you peer reviewed Dr. Brown's, and then you uh, uh, tweeted out uh, Dr. Sirkeel's. A while ago. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, between these three articles, you can find five different explanations that are given. The first is the catch all abrogation. Abrogation means we cancel out this verse. Imagine if I came in and said, I'm going to cancel out all those verses, they're canceled. You would look at me and you'd be like, look at this hippy dippy liberal just saying that you're canceling out verses. That is textual acrobatics, number one. Number two, that actually shows that the, the exegetes actually did understand the most obvious interpretation of that verse. Otherwise, they wouldn't need to consider it to be abrogated or canceled out. Number two, so that's the first explanation that gives, and that's the article that Dr. Brown cited. He actually is going in this direction, that it was abrogated. But if it was, and then, why, if it was abrogated, 
then why is it repeated in Surah 569? We all know that Surah 5 is the last Surah that was revealed, and it's repeated in 569. So if it really is about past Jews and Christians, even you take that explanation, why is it being repeated at the end of the Prophet's life? Surely now they've all converted to Islam, capital I Islam, right? So the second explanation that is given is that, yes, that I found in those articles, as well as in the, obviously in the exegesis, is that it refers to those Jews and Christians who converted to Islam. But if that's the case, then they would no longer be Jews and Christians. They would be Muslims. And the Jews and the Christians, by the way, they weren't called Jews and Christians. Moses' followers were not called Jews, right? Jesus' followers were not called Christians. Even according to the Quran, they were called Muslimun, right? Then it refers, the third explanation is the one that Dr. al-Masri is relying on, that it refers to past Jews and Christians. The problem with this explanation is that there are many, many verses that talk about how they are still a upright community amongst them and that they are still believing and, and, and that they are a saved community. So that explanation is, and it's also a very biased way of reading the text. Every time you see negative verses about the people of the book, those, those are for right now. But anytime you see verses that are praising the people of the book, then you say it's talking about the past Jews and Christians. And then there's also another verse that you can look at that proves this wrong. Verse 2217 says, as for those who believe and those who are Jews, the Sabians, the Christians, the Magians, and the idolaters, indeed God will judge between them on the day of resurrection. Clearly, this is not talking about the ones in the past. It's talking about the ones in the present. Also, and lastly, the verses immediately preceding 569 make it clear that it is referring to current Jews and Christians. Verse 566 says, there is a moderate community amongst you. And then I'm just going to quickly say the other two explanations that are given. Uh, there was one explanation in Dr. Qadi's article that those who believe actually refers to the hypocrites. That is textual acrobatics to a magnificent effect to say that those who believe is actually uh, hypocrites and therefore all of these categories are negative and they're all uh, being warned here. Uh, but you see this. So this is the textual acrobatics I'm talking about. And then finally, the <laughs> fifth explanation I didn't find in these articles, but it's commonly heard that Jews and Christians will be rewarded in this life, but not the next. But clearly, th that passage is talking about salvation in the hereafter because it's using the verbiage, no fear shall come upon them, nor shall they grieve. So I'm actually saying that, yes, we're looking at a very literal understanding of these verses in, in this debate. Um, well, so that's my view. Okay. It uh, sounds you, like you need to... Just respond. one little thing. Yeah. Going to an explanation of the book, of the Qur'an, with other verses that give you details about it. That's tafsir of the Qur'an by the Qur'an. So let's just take a simple example. You quoted 569. Lo, those who believe, in the okay, and those who are Jews, and the Sabians and the Christians, those who believe in God in the last day. We addressed this. And they did good. Don't, no, there shall be no fear for them, nor shall they grieve. Okay? All right. Just read the next verse. We made a covenant with the children of Israel, and we sent unto them messengers, as often as a messenger came unto them, all right, with what their souls did not desire, they rejected them, and some they killed. So how is it accepting their current state of rejection of the prophet? No, it is saying, you... As a Jew, when you complete your faith, because he's criticizing, you rejected prophets. So two verses back to back saying the opposite thing? No, this one is the detailed verse is always the one that gives the explanation of the summary verse. Next one. Okay. They thought no harm would come of it. They thought no harm would come of for rejecting the prophet, peace be upon. I mean, it's literally talking to your argument. Okay. So they are willfully blind and deaf to the necessity of believing in the prophet. Okay. They thought no harm would come to the rejecting of the prophet. And they made themselves not hear and not see the truth. Surely they disbelieved. I should just say this for the whole argument, right? For the whole debate. Which verse is that? You cited 569. Mm -hmm. I didn't even cite it. I just looked it up right now. No, can you tell me the verse that you just cited? 570. Okay, great. 571. Excellent. 572. Oh, children of Israel. Okay. Who... Uh, Whoso ascribes for, uh, uh, Allah, those who say God is the is the Messiah, Son of Mary, addressing Christians. Okay. O children of Israel, worship Allah, one God, and do not ascribe partners to Him. They surely disbelieve when they say God is the third of three, three essences, whatever you want to say. He's the third of three. So how is it that the very next set of verses are attacking, decimating their theology that they're upon? 
one of my theory, not, it's not my theory, right? This is basic 101. The, the Quran explains the Quran. The believing Jew and Christian is the one who has completed his faith. Otherwise, how do we explain all these attacks on the Trinity? Attacks on Jews rejecting prophets. Okay, the Messiah, son of the Mary, was no other than a messenger. Okay, he passed away. Him and his mother were right. His were righteous. They both ate food, meaning they're not gods, because if you eat food, you go to the bathroom. Does God go to the bathroom? Right? Say, serve ye in place of Allah that which possesseth you neither hurt nor use. And other verses. Oh, people of the scripture. Stop saying what is untrue about your religion and your religion, meaning you are on a wrong path right now. Are these not convincing verses that you're not on the right path? Don't follow your forefathers who went astray. They altered the book. They said wrong things about Jesus. They rejected prophets. You pointed me to this verse. It wasn't even part of my argument. Okay. That's why I said this concept, it jumps out at you with the Quran. Open the Quran and read it yourself. It jumps out at you. Okay. You kick this thing. Your forefathers went astray. How am I going to follow them? They went astray. And they caused many to go astray. And they went far astray. Listen, people don't have to be Muslim. We're not forcing anyone. But you cannot say that the Quran is accepting of Jewish doctrine. You cannot say the Quran is accepting of the Trinity. It's just illogical. Okay? Forget consensus. Let's just go by logic. Those are the children of Israel who disbelieved are cursed. Disbelieved in who? All of God's prophets. They're cursed for disbelieving. Disbelieving in what? So that's the second thing. There's summary, there's details, and then ask the question. Disbelieved in what? Clearly the verse before says all the prophets. Okay? Um, Good. I'd love to uh, respond to that, though. Um, so I think it's really great to look at the surrounding context, and so that's what we need to do. So let's look. no context, just the verse. Yes, exactly. So let's let's look. So we have two theses. Okay, one is that the Quran is uh, had some positive things to say, but then switched to condemnation, and that's actually the one we're going to prioritize. No, it's not the case but, at all. Wait, can I just so, so yeah. you, you raise your argument? So um, so the the second thesis is that the Quran is being selective and criticizing those people of the book when they do wrong. So these are two theses. Okay, let's see which one actually shakes out in this surah itself. Okay, so in that same surah, earlier on, it's talking about following, had they observed the Torah and the gospel, it says, you stand on not till you observe the Torah and the gospel. This is verse 68, right? The one right before it. So what it's actually criticizing the people of the book, this is the verse before you cited the verse after, let me quote the verse before. It says, you stand on not till you observe the Torah and the gospel, which goes against the uh, exclusivist theology that considers that to be abrogated. It's actually criticizing them for not following their scriptures. So yes, the Quran does condemn people of the book and chastises them just like it chastises believers. It calls them hypocrites. Very harsh language against believers who are considered hypocrites. So just having harsh language doesn't mean that they're all damned. Then he mentioned the very next passages which talk about the criticism of God as the Messiah. This is really sad, unfortunately, how exclusivists read these passages. It actually is insulting to the Quran because it makes it look like the Quran was authored by an idiot. Because we, it makes it sound like the Quran doesn't understand Christian theology. No Christian today says God is the Messiah. No Christian says third of the three. This is actually referring to... This is actually referring to Byzantine imperial theology that was present at that time in which the Quran is specifically engaging with and being critical of Byzantine imperial theology. You can watch an excellent lecture on this by a Christian theologian who actually reads the, Christian, the critique of the Quran against the Trinity and says, I agree with you. Thank you for making this critique. This is if you read it with actually understanding and reading other religions and their theology. But if we keep going forward, you see that the Quran is saying that there are disbelievers among them. Verse 580 says, because they allied with those who disbelieved. You see many of them allying with those who disbelieved. But then look at verse 582. We're not far off. So we, if we want to look, let's look at the whole surah. What does 582 say? It says the nearest in affection to the believers are the, Christ, are the Christians. You will find the nearest of them in affection towards those who believe to be those who say we are Christians. This is because among them are priests and monks and because they are not arrogant. Okay, and then you have um, 
you have the very end of the surah that we should look at. So how does the surah end? Does it end with condemnation and chastisement of the Christians? No. What it ends with is Jesus disassociates himself from his followers when they say that, take me as a Lord. And he says, no, I didn't say that. And then what does it say? This is the key part. It says, this is Jesus speaking to God in the Quran at the end of the very surah that he and I are debating, which is a continuous thing, so you can't just take one part or the other. It says, Jesus says, if you punish them, they are indeed your servants. But if you forgive them, then indeed you are the mighty, the wise. How does God respond to them? God responds positively to his request and said God is content with them and they are content with him. This is how the Quran ends on this. So it ends on a positive note. So what is the counter thesis to what Dr. Al-Masri is saying? The counter thesis is that the Quran does criticize beliefs of the people of the book, including the Trinity and especially Christian heresies that were associated with Byzantine imperial theology. But this is not a blanket judgment on all Jews and Christians. And you see that it ends on a note of mercy with Jesus himself asking for forgiveness. And there's another verse in the Quran in which God promises Jesus that he will place his followers, Jesus' followers, above the idolaters on the next day, on the next, uh, in the next life. So we see that it's not a blanket judgment against them. Yes, it's not a blanket. It's a blanket judgment against those who did not complete their following of the scriptures by believing in the last prophet. And in 582, you contradicted your thesis. When you cite, all right, you will find amongst you, okay. You said, you just quoted, you will find the nearest of those to the believers are the Christians. Therefore, Christians are not believers. I said they're not believers. You're saying Christians? Christians were Muslims, so they are the the believers in the Quran are the mu'min. Which and are who are they? Which are the believers, those who believe in the Prophet Muhammad as their prophets and follow Quranic law, whereas the submitters or the Muslimun are the Jews and the Christians and other monotheists no. who submit to God and His uh, Prophet and His community, but follow their own religious laws and scriptures. No. This, this, all this complication. God doesn't play tricks. He gives a book for everybody to understand. So why? Uh, what? What about five? Uh, what about two sixty-two? Why did he make it so confusing? Like, I was not you, confusing. If, you, if you get educated, if you, if you, well, I'm, I'm serious. I, I think, just read these verses. Yeah. Admit to them. So, right. So I got a question are, for you. Are Jesus you is not God in Christian doctrine. Is that where we're headed to? I, I didn't. I didn't um, say okay. that. Okay. That's said, what you said. I oh. said, you said I, we can ask Dr. Reinhardt as I a said, Christian I said, specialist. Do Christians say Jesus is God? Yes or no? I, I didn't am, say that. You I, didn't hear what I said. I said they don't say God is the Messiah. See, this is that. Well, well, who well, is well, the well, Messiah? Is Jesus? Time out. Time out. This is the hate. Jesus way. is God. God is Jesus. So I two said, plus three equals five. Three plus two equals five. I it's said, the same thing. I said that, at the beginning. I said at the beginning when in my introduction, <clears throat> I'm here as the facilitator, not as a participant. Well, we need an expert debate. right now. As a Christian theologian. Every Christian I met, Jesus as, is God, everywhere. As a Christian theologian, I will yes. not get drawn into this debate. Okay. <laughs> this, Can we this, get an expert witness? We'll give you a bottle this, of water. No, no, this is... Is this, Jesus God, yes or no, in Christian dogma? So the Christian polemicists will actually say that the Quran gets it completely wrong here when they say will, God is the Messiah. They say the Messiah is God, but they do not say God is the Messiah. I will, I will in not, math, in I math, will there's wrong. that. I what is that principle? Get, three plus two equals this is, five. This is no. a, two plus three all equals is, five. It's no. the same thing. I God said, is Allah. Allah I, is God. I, I also said to you at the beginning. Commutative? Sorry to cut you I off. Also, no, I also yeah. said to you at the beginning. In each of our religions, we like to explain ourselves rather than be explained. So you explain yourself. Dr. Hashmi explains himself. Okay. I'm not able to sit here and be explained as a Christian. You got drawn into it. <laughs> I, no. So you need I to refuse. give us the simple answer. Is what can you go to chat GBT and ask? Is <laughs> no. Jesus God in Christianity? No. But no, that's not what was <laughs> no, I'm this not this is not this is not the question. The answer is very nuanced, and if we can schedule another debate about this. Christianity. I'll be partic I'll be watching. You'll be watching. You I can't to, participate. You need to participate. I think yeah. maybe we are closer than you imagine 
we are. Uh, but I will at this point not get drawn into it. Instead, what I will do is to introduce a couple of questions actually from the audience because okay, this, is, this has gotten a little heated. And uh, so one of one... Uh, I don't one, have an assistant giving me uh, notes. I should have gotten an assistant too. Getting getting cheat no, sheets. It's, it's, who's no, getting it's the notes? questions. It's questions. <laughs> oh, these that, are questions. Okay. That, those are questions. I thought I thought no, Dr. Those, those is getting are not a cue cards. This, okay. is, this good, is, good. is not late night TV where I need a cue okay. card. <laughs> <laughs> One of the questions for Dr. Hashbi was, how do you reconcile your position with uh, the second proposition of the Shahada, namely the Muslim? Uh, uh, confession of faith, and maybe you can expand and explain to those of us who are not Muslims what this is before you before you give your answer. Yeah, thank you so much. So I I do think what Dr. Kraus said is extremely important. When we talk about somebody else's religion or religious belief, it's important to let them explain what their religious belief is. And on that basis, I would refer you to Dr. Klaus von Stosch's lecture called Jesus and Mary in the Quran, in which he lays this out in great detail, how no Christian would say, alive today really, would say God is the Messiah. You may not understand this nuance, but imagine if someone else, is, uh, a Christian, is talking about Islamic aqidah and uh, theology and getting these fine points wrong and saying that Ashari say this and, and getting it completely wrong and you saying, well, it's the same thing. This is like butchering their religion. Um, so that's, that's the first point. Now, as far as... Um, the question that's being asked, it's asking, so the, the declaration of faith consists of two parts. The first part is that there is no God but God. And the second part is, and Muhammad is his messenger. Well, actually, if you look at the historical evidence, we have archaeological evidence, we have inscriptional evidence. We, it finds that in the first 70 years, actually, it was only the first part of the testimony of faith that we find in the physical evidence. So it was only at a later point in time that the second part was brought in. This is actually a proof against this view and brought up by historians to show not that they didn't consider Muhammad a prophet or a messenger, but that this wasn't a top line issue that would exclude you from the community. It's exactly when this second part was introduced that then the borders were drawn up and then Jews and Christians were expelled from the fold, theologically speaking. So this actually is a point in the favor of those who argue that the early borders were in fact fuzzy. What historians are saying this? What about the event? You can look at the inscription. So, so we need physical evidence. There's transmitted yes. evidence. So you evidence is transmitted too. So a, so I have to find. So where is the evidence that anything happened? I need to find a chisel on a mountain somewhere. I need to find a document. Who wrote the document? Human beings, and it's transmitted. No, this is unacceptable. You cannot just rely upon history on chisels in mountains and Dead Sea Scrolls and all sorts of uh, artifacts. It's not the only way that history is transmitted. It's impossible. We cannot have any history. We don't know anything about ourselves if that's the only way we're going to operate. So now we're going to stand up and announce the Shahada to enter a bill Muslim is not Muhammad Rasulullah. Like where, how far is this going? Jesus is not the son of God. Muhammad Rasul is not part of the, Jesus is not God in Christianity. Muhammad Rasul is not part of, like, what's next? Is Judaism based on Moses anymore? Like, what is next? So, unfortunately. This, this, these major things, God is talking to regular people. When God sends a messenger with the major issue, he's talking to normal people. I don't want to hear the word nuance in this subject. In this subject, there are certain subjects. Not every subject can have nuance or else we won't know anything. In logic, there are doruri, there's complex information and there's simple information. Complex information is composed of simple information, right? Two plus two is four, simple information, okay? A quarter of a tenth of 40 is one, okay? Complex, it needs some thought. If everything is nuanced and complex, nobody would know anything. If everything is simple, we'd all be scholars. But there is simple information and complex information. Jesus being central and being worshipped in Christianity, okay, is simple. All of history knows this. Everybody knows this, okay? There's no nuance here. Jesus is worshipped. He is a divine. Muhammad Rasulullah is part of the Shahada. 
Yeah. So would you say that because it's been transmitted that by a multitude of people that Jesus was resurrected, that we would take that Christian claim. There are Christian dogmatists who say the exact same thing about their religion, and yet we don't accept it. But what we can do is we can be critical, and we could say, why is it the case that the first, so this is a quote from a scholar, a historian, the first documentary attestations of the Shahada, that is the uh, testimony of faith, include only the first element, not who the second. Who are these historians? The first, they are people who actually go and look. So okay. it's not just... So it's why, not just, why it's not the just, Muslim historians accepted? Muslim historian. There biased. are Muslim historians. Look at uh, there. There's so many Muslim historians in in the academy. Look at Ahmed no. Jalad. I mean, like okay. these. Okay. What about Abu Hanifa, Malik, so Bukhari? Imagine, all of a sudden they're out. They're, they're, they're out. out. They're not but out. The atheist sipping but latte. Imagine, he knows best about Islamic Imagine history. if somebody said, "I'm quoting Saint Augustine, and I'm going to say, how dare you say that this verse about the Trinity doesn't actually go back to Jesus? How many of you guys would take that as as being convincing? This is all special pleading." This is not what special Muslims pleading. engage in. This is not special pleading. So if yeah. is not a guy in a, a Western liberal university. It's, it's not a Western liberal university. No, that's all your people. It's academics who engage in the historical critical approach, which includes yeah. Muslims. So the early Hadith scholars, they're not academics? So they for, were, what were they? So that is it. So exactly. Would you say then the Christian scholars, the medieval scholastics, they were just a bunch of dummies and idiots? I accept their transmission if they have some chain. They, ha they claim all of those so things. So bring it. So, right. okay, um, let me get in another question because clearly we are not having a meeting of the minds. Well, right? this is the fun part. Well, right? Right. <laughs> I, think, I, I think both of him, me and him are alike in the sense that we, yes. we have thick skin. So. Yes, yes. We, we're not having a meeting of the minds and I don't see any point of you converting the other at, on this question. Um, oh, can I just, sorry, no, one? No, well, no. he has already half admitted no. that I could be right. Yeah. I said he cannot be right. What did so, I have to you, okay. you said that the, you admit that the Quran may say that you have to respect Muhammad. This is already in socially, my notes from And before. maybe this as is, a prophet. That was is, in your notes. Yeah. So you're already notes. half admitting to that, uh, that this is correct. Can, so can can we, all right, good. So we don't have we, a debate. Can we allow a question yeah. well, from the do. audience? Do they follow the Torah and the yeah. gospel? Or are they because, allowed to follow? So, so that's the key part Dr. of the Dr. El Masri, uh, a question from the audience is, what do you think of Dr. Donna's thesis that the way the term Muslim was used at the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, is different to the way it is used today. Uh, if I understood it correctly, that it is used in a more comprehensive sense. Is that completely absurd? Yes. Okay. That's how simple it is. It's a completely absurd take. It's a completely absurd take. He is not even, he, what's his evidence? Have you read his book? He's not relevant. That's why I didn't read it. I'm sorry to say this. So someone who says something that an entire civilization, how they label themselves, and the Quran, Muslimun. He named you Muslims. Okay. And Muslims is something, a word that shows up in all of the early history. Okay. All of the hadith. It's just because somebody brings up an absurd, hot academic take. That's what it is. There are some people who do hot takes on Twitter, and other people do hot takes on academic presses. It's a hot take. Would you okay. say that you pre-already consider it inadmissible so that you can't even consider that viewpoint? So is it a presumption that it's a priori false, whatever a historian like Fred Donner would say? His conclusion, okay, with all due respect, that the word Muslim does not imply the follower of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Is that the summary of the conclusion? No, that's actually the problem is that when you oh, it's tell people's yes, it's nuanced. I, you don't, don't give even, me nuance when it comes to the prophet. A messenger came from God, his followers are called it. Muslims. That's the, that is what we're saying. A messenger came to you from God, you follow him, you're a Muslim. Okay. So why then there are Jews, then there are Christians, so, so then there are pagans, then there are Hindus. Like, where are we going with this? So what why, are we merging here? I showed you the verse where the Christians do the Christians ever Muslim call themselves Muslims? Why does the Quran call the Christians Muslim? The people of the past submitted to it's, all of God's it's prophets. It's actually criticizing the current Christians for deifying Jesus and then says, why would you disbelieve when you were submitters, Muslim? You were accepting so that, so, so that, submission so those means are you were accepting the latest prophet that came to you. You were accepting of it. Okay. <laughs> Muslims, you were accepting. So Ibrahim was a Muslim. Yes, he was accepting all of God's commandments. Then the Jews came, or the Moses came. 
All of those, they accepted Moses. They are submitting. They are Muslim to Moses. They are submitting to Moses. Then Jesus came. Then they submitted to him. Then Muhammad came. And this is what we are going to name you. He named you the Muslim. Now that's your name. It's an attribute of everybody, but this is now your name. Um, question for uh, uh, Dr. Hashmi. And to some extent, I think it's also a question for Dr. Masri from the audience. Why exclude the, the Hadith from the... Um, from the consideration and discussion. Uh, you would, except for this debate, probably not exclude them. I would but, love to include Hadith. Yes. So, okay. so, but why, why exclude them? Uh, can you explain why, as a concession for this debate, you're excluding the Hadith? I think that's a great question. So, um, first, there's a three-hour interview on the same channel that this is streaming on about this very topic, where we go into great depth as to why historians are skeptical of the Hadith. Now, uh, in the article that was cited, Dr. Qadi, uh, he, he says, quote, it is simply not possible to formulate a pluralist interpretation of Islam except by neglecting or rejecting the Hadith corpus. I will say, said another way, it is not possible to formulate an exclusivist interpretation of the Quran except by superimposing the Hadith onto the Quran. Compare, for example, the Hadith that Dr. Qadi cites, which is, I swear by him in whose hands is my soul, there is no single Jew or Christian who hears about me and that dies not having believed in my message, except that he shall be of the denizens of hell. Crystal clear. It's as clear as 262 the other way around, right? Any neutral person will say that. Now, why is there no such clear verse in the Quran? Why is there this divergence between the Quran and the Hadith? We have to ask that. Well, the obvious answer is that it's reflective of a later theology. In fact, like I said, this Hadith itself, there's a Hadith that says this thing and uses the word Ummah, meaning there's this uh, clear evidence that they were part of the Ummah at some point in time. Now, and that's this one in, uh, by him in whose hand, Muhammad's soul, anyone of this Ummah, Jew or Christian, who hears of me and then dies without believing in my message, will meet, be among those who go to hell. So this shows the motivated reasoning and the anxiety that's at, at play. So the reason why we can't use hadith is because historians acknowledge that the initial transmission was atomistic, paraphrastic, and subjected to drastic mutations. And the way we know that is by looking at the proof in the pudding. If you look at the Quran and compare it to the hadith corpus, the Quran does not have historical anachronisms in it. Meanwhile, the Hadith corpus is full of historical anachronisms. Now, you have to ask yourself, why is it that Western historians who are non-Muslim affirm that the Quran goes back to the Prophet Muhammad, but don't accept that with the Hadith? Are they liberal Muslims in hiding? Is that what their intent is? No, this is the ruling that they get when they simply look at the evidence and realize that the Hadith is full of historical anachronisms where Muhammad is said to say things that clearly were about this sect, this group, this occurrence. It's just painfully obvious. So this is the reason why that we don't look at the Hadith. And my last point on this is we can look at this specific issue and find how conflicting the Hadith are on this topic, which is another reason why historians don't rely on the Hadith, because they're reflecting. There's a rule. For every Hadith, there is an equal and opposite Hadith. Every group has a hadith that they can use, a saying that they could use. And in Dr. Brown's article itself, you find these conflicting hadith. There are hadith that can be used to say that all monotheists will be saved. Then other hadith that will say, no, it's actually the people uh, who believe in Prophet Muhammad who will be saved. And there are other views as well. So all of these conflicting reports is the reason why we don't look at this. This is obviously reflecting the anxieties of a later generation. That doesn't mean that as believers, we can't use hadith in a religious way. But that's a separate conversation entirely. Uh, well, it's, I don't uh, think so. I no. mean, we have so many questions already. Can you write it down? Yeah. <coughs> yeah. I don't want to. Okay. Uh, um, let's. The, 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 if I can answer that, please. Okay. The Quran does say the exact same thing that the Prophet said. Any Jew and Christian from my ummah, which ummah? The ummah that he's, there is the ummah that he's delivering his message to, the nation of people that he's delivering his message to, okay? Who do not, who hear of me and do not believe in me are in the fire. 
the Quran, ayah number six of Surah Al Bayyana. Lo, those who disbelieve, who are they? Among the people of the scripture and the idolaters will abide in the fire. It's the what, same exact thing. Sorry, I, w I missed the what verse did you say? 98, Surah Al Bayyana, verse six. Thanks. Okay. So it is giving it. So we're not here to discuss why we're not using hadith. And I'm, I'm glad the question was brought up because that's a whole nother debate you could have with another person on the reliability of hadith. But we all seem to agree that the Quran is reliable. Why were they able to transmit that? Secondly, the hadith have inconsistency. Who's telling us this? We know this. The Muslim historians themselves are the number one people to attack other transmitters. Fabricators, weak. It's called jarh wa ta'deel. Attacking transmitters. His honesty can be attacked. His accuracy can be attacked. We take from so-and-so and we don't take from so-and-so. We They even have a man named Hisham, okay, on Ibn Urwa, Ibn Zubair, and they have brought it down to precision of when he got weak in transmission. They said when he was in Medina, surrounded by the elder scholars, okay, he transmitted properly. As soon as he went up to uh, Basra or to another, a, he went to another city, and he was the most senior scholar, he became loose. I, they, I'd like to. So, but let um, me once say one thing. I, I need to do a quick. Quick who? Oh no! Almost done. I, yeah, I like please. to get another question. But in. real quick okay. response, if you no, allow me. Okay. One thing: Who transmitted the Arabic language? Okay. And why these undertones? As I said before, they're anxieties, showing anxieties, like they're just trying to keep our civilization together. Let's make up hadiths. Let's put lines because we're nervous about the Jews and Christians. What are you saying? Did not the Prophet peace be upon him bring disparate tribes, all united? Who hated each other? So why didn't he be so clear that Jews are your brothers, Christians are your brothers? Right? The last speech of the Prophet, peace be upon him. There, there's no benefit of a black over a white, no virtue of uh, Arab over non-Arab. Why not? If he's able to bring all these people together, Dr. he Dr. could have easily brought can Jews I, and Christians together. Can I just yes, one one quick? Go ahead. So I think this is a perfect example. You cited verse 98:6. You said, because 98.6 says, truly the disbelievers among the people of the book and the idolaters are in the fire of hell abiding therein. This is the proof it's, text that was, wait, hold on one second. It's so, min. Hold on, hold on one second. Mm. Verse 98.5, right before it, actually says that the people of the book follow the upright religion. Amongst them are the people who follow the upright religion. And then the very verse that comes right after what Dr. al Mustri cited says, truly those who believe and perform righteous deeds, it is they who are the best of creation, referring again to the people of the book. So the Quran is clearly criticizing a portion of the people of the book, not all of them. Which portion? And so it's important, it's, it's very much important to read the Quran carefully that's, and in a nuanced that's fashion. That's wonderful. Which portion okay. is he criticizing? Okay, so, I, have to, I have to call it this mm. exchange to a halt, and we're probably able to get in one more question. We probably have, I don't know, we, I have- Keep a, going, I got all night. Yeah, nice. these are not notes. I these got. Are actually, yeah. uh, otherwise, I would have loved to have gone all night. Yes. But, mm. So, one one question for Dr. El Masri, and if you can be quick, is uh, or brief. Uh, often, transmitted stories are changed over time, like in the game of telephone. One of the listeners is asking, "Are you saying that we should disregard?" The written and archaeological evidence and just keep the transmitted evidence in higher regard well archaeological written word um like which one it is evidence but just because something's written just as something spoken doesn't make it sound right so yeah we do accept engravings but we don't limit our history to scrolls and engravings right but I, the question is and asking, what, are they disregarded? No, they're not disregarded. Why would we accept random engravings by non-Muslims? But we don't accept the first generation oh, of Muslims. By, they're by Muslims. Okay, Muslims. Engravings. Believers. Yeah, why would we not accept right, all of it then? If we're going to accept those, accept the rest. Okay. Right? Can I respond? So, but I, have to, I, I also have a question. Which Jews and Christians? Among the Jews and Christians, which ones? What wrong action did they do that puts them into the anger of God? What is the wrong action that they do? Um, That's the question. So that they can be guided, right? 
I need to know what am I doing wrong? I'm a Jew and a Christian. Dr. Javad saying, among you are good and some of you are bad. Okay, can you list me what's bad so I can avoid it? What is bad? 